Good afternoon again. Water, food, energy nexus. Let's get started. Water. What do we need to live? What do we need to enjoy life? It's actually an ecological Maslow triangle. What makes us happy? What makes us healthy? We have middle school girls putting together the water cycle while they're exploring water facts. Here I am drinking water, holding it in my hand, and it reminds me of holding a baby that is 75% water. Whereas adults, <clears throat> such as you and, and me, are about 60% water. Now, hopefully in the Maslow's Triangle prior to this, that you were able to put down water as something that made you happy because without water, we would not be alive. And a healthy person usually has around nine to 12 cups of water and it helps us grow, it helps renew our cells and so on. But truthfully, there are water problems around the world only four out of 10 people, four out of 10 people have no access to clean water. And some people you'll see in a moment have to walk miles just to just get one can of water. For many of us, we just turn on the tap and it comes. But there are problems with our water sources all around the world. And that's why we need to rethink them. So here we are, we've clicked on the water journey and we're going to start looking at we can live 30 days without food, but only three to five with water. And then we're going to think about where water is on earth. Well, you've probably seen a globe and you probably guess that 71% is covered with water. And the students say, why isn't it called ocean if it's more ocean than land? And then we give them five cups with a pitcher of water and they have to label the cups with where the water is. They have to come up and think about it. It's not at the tap, it's their sources of water. This is the worksheet that you can, um, Donna will have and share with you. And you can start right here. We've helped you a little bit with the five cups with different amounts. And then there's a chance to draw the water cycle. So here is where water is on the earth. Oceans at 71% coverage is 97% of the world's water, but it's salty. The glaciers come, the ice caps, they're frozen, they're ice, we can't drink them. They are melting, some of them, many of them, and they're going into the ocean. It's the groundwater, less than 1%, and also the rivers, lakes, and wetlands, which is amazing. And then finally, just the littlest drop in the atmosphere. But which of these is really drinkable? It's the groundwater above and below the ground and the rivers, lakes, and wetlands. So let's take a look at the precipitation and remember those days when you learned the names of the clouds. It's time to look again and remember the ones that are the rainmaker clouds so that you can tell the weather and predict when the rain is coming. We take students, fourth graders and high schoolers to the river and they actually play the water cycle game contributed by the Friends of the Chicago River where they get a card and they're an animal or a flower or a worm or a bird and they have to go find their um, station and do what it says and then put the card in and pick up another one. And they do this for about 10 minutes and they said, um, when does this end? And then we all laugh because the water cycle never stops moving. Many cycles in nature never stop moving. And that's the point to think about it as not a fixed thing. So if something is in complex, it can't be fixed with just one thing. We show them a three dimensional water cycle. So they begin to understand the relationships between the geosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and atmosphere and the different stages and states of water. We look at a great UW-Madison map. Where does the world receive rain? And you can see the dry areas will certainly be either <laughs> dry deserts or perhaps maybe just get very little rain every year. And we talk about where does the rain come first? If you're um, marooned on an island and you're thirsty and there's a few drops, first it's going to stick to your tongue and you can go, oh, thank you for the rain. 
remember the indigenous people's rain dances, but here on the earth, it hits the top of our mountains first and notice it goes down by gravity. It goes down and down and down it can, can, until it can go no longer and that's called a watershed. So here's the watershed of the east and western fork of the White River in Indiana. Here is Muncie, here's Indianapolis and there are other rivers. And you can see that it actually looks almost like a lung, very fibrous, but with liquid going through it. The girls get a chance to build watersheds with a cookie sheet, foil, some sponges, and some spray bottles. And they find right of way that the um, water runs off the foil, it's absorbed by the spinach, but what about these red areas? The red areas is where the water is collect is collected and can't drain. And it's where it becomes acid or toxic because it collects the um, storm particulate matters from Canada's burning fires or industry particulate matter that sits down and it becomes polluted. And then it pollutes the groundwater below it. We then show a map where the students go, what's wrong? What's the Mississippi doing river doing all the way over there? That's not the Mississippi River, that's the Continental Divide. And when it rains, everything that hits the Rocky Mountains goes to the left, to the Pacific, and goes to the right, to the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico and the Mississippi. And actually, <clears throat> there are several uh, sub watersheds in the world, and you'll find out in just a moment why this is important. But here's one of the links. It's showing up here, a colored map of all the different water maps that some of these are Eastern, some are Western, but then it will also show the different ones and you can map them because the watershed includes wetlands. How many of you knew that wetlands have more biodiversity of life even than rainforests? And here they are across the world and you'll see they're not where there isn't a lot of rain. But now if you look at this, this is how the wetlands were right here before. And now look now, they are disappearing. And that's part of the trouble with our fresh water. Because you see here, it's an aquifer. Here's where it rains and it um, rooftop lakes or you know on the ground streams. Some of it goes into an open aquifer, which Every time it floods or rains hard, it drains through this topsoil and collects there. Um, but then there is a confined aquifer that it takes hundreds to thousands of years for the water to get through the rocks and the miserable. This is where you see the stalactites and stalagmites of minerals dripping underground. Those are also being used up. The Mexico City is drinking straws down here and drinking up the unconfined aquifer. And so the buildings are starting to sink because with the water there filling the volume, it holds the earth up, particularly here. This actually, when this is empty, then it's a cave ready to collapse. So moving on to another water journey, rivers. Taking everyday um, equipment, about $10 a piece, students are asked to become citizen scientists. They're going to look at temperature, uh, decibel readings, light meters, and use GoPro cameras to capture light above, below, and under, <laughs> and on the water. So they're getting the equipment, they're taking notes, they're starting to listen, to look, to think, and to learn. The first thing they said along the Chicago River is, well, there are no sponges here. Everything is hard. It's asphalt, it's concrete, it's buildings. And many of my architecture students call the city a concrete jungle. So we created the rivers worksheet, which you will have access to, where students sketch a natural river with a natural riverine edge. And you can even have them document how it's filtrated with the soil and the plants, and it gives off oxygen as they take in the carbon dioxide. Or you can go further up or down the river and take a picture of one of the many industries because the river in industries became, were first a liquid highway before we had the trains, before we had a major road system. And so that's where all the industries are. And many of those industrial neighborhoods are vacant now. 
thankfully, this big, loud, dirty, <laughs> polluting um, factory is now closed and it's probably going to be turned into a water filtering, some type of venue. In the water uh, journey and the river journey, watershed journey, you can access the Wiki Watershed, which is an incredibly great site and resource for students to continue their citizen scientist. Here's the Muncie River because I used to live and swim in this pool before going to teach in the school. And here you can see the hydrologic soil group distribution. You can click on the streams and see the streams feeding into the river, learn about the land, the soil, its makeup, the terrain, the contour, the climate, so the temperature range, point sources of pollution along the White River, the animals that are there. In the 1950s, there used to be chickens and goats and cows. Now most of those are domestic pets and cats. And then finally, the water quality. If you look at the chart, they'll say it's moderate infiltration, particularly here, and slow infiltration because it's covered. <laughs> We've actually destroyed nature and removed it. And that's not a great thing to do. So we're gonna go back and students can quickly look at what happens to a wetland. There's zero runoff, there's evapotranspiration and a lot of collection of water. When it's a forest, there is no runoff. There is great infiltration because of the deeper roots of the trees that talk to each other and precipitation and evapotranspiration. You can see the story shifts with single family suburban homes on one to five acres. And we're starting to harden that soil, compact it because it's construction. And then basically it's almost all runoff in the city and it has no infiltration, it means there's no life in that soil because it has no access to worms and insects, it's all concretized. So as we're going along the river, it's very exciting. Some, we just passed the amphitheater that steps down um, where student faculty and teachers sit and they actually planted a couple trees there, which was wonderful. But this is a phytoremediation series of plants that are floating, their roots are in the water, they're taking in the toxins, up here, they're taking in the land and then deeper into the river. And they also host fish hotels where fish feel safe to leave their eggs and have them. And then right to the right is where the park district fishes with the public. And they are so proud because in 1975, there were only two species of fish in the river. And now they're over 75 species. And so they keep track of the ones that they have caught and throw them back. The students start to think about what gives us water pollution, industrial waste, municipal waste, agricultural waste, natural waste, which is pretty biodegradable, but the rest of these are linear and not regenerative and so on. So here they are, they all just took a break and had their glass of water from this jar. Uh, the pieces of watercolor represent um, plots of land with a river running through it that they are going to each become responsible for and they can design and develop whatever they would like there. And then <clears throat> with the existing land, they each get a little jar of the pollution that's on that land. So here you can see they're all excited to design and draw and they poured all of their pollutants <clears throat> into the river. No one is going to call that iced tea and no one is going to drink it. They put the puzzle together, they're all excited. And then we ask them, well, which way is the river flowing? They go, oh, and they all point to the left. We go, okay, let's start to the right then. Those owners contribute the garbage that's under the table, put it up. That's what they produce based on their needs and their use and their function. And then you're going to pass it to the next neighbor and the next neighbor all the way down to the river until the teacher there with the arms extended in the green sweater has this much garbage. You see, human systems are linear. They start out with good intentions, but they end up as waste. And our landfills are filling up. And that waste is going into our water systems, our rivers and our oceans. And inside the bellies of the fish and inside the babies that we bear. So it's time to change the linear system to a circular system. 
So as I mentioned before, the links, let's look at other people really taking this issue and creating a group of people working on it. And they tell us that 50% of the world's rivers are too polluted to use. So this is what we're going to leave it with, but we're still excited because we can find the Amazon, the Nile, um, the Mississippi. And we began to look at that. And some of the students say, those look like the veins and arteries of our body. And then when we ask, what happens when they become polluted? And they look at each other soberly and they say, heart attacks and ill health. And we go, you're right. It's no different with rivers. We shift to chemistry, the H2O, so they can understand the hydrogen and the oxygen, and they can actually then go back to the river and test water for turbidity or the um, darkness of it with organic and inorganic materials and microscopic organisms, the temperature, the alkalinity, and the oxygen. Colder temperatures actually hold more oxygen and there can be very little life with no oxygen in the water. Fish require oxygen. Plants require in the water require oxygen, just like people. And at that point, everybody can put in their zip code and check out their water. Have there been any aberrations from the national standards in the last two or three months? It's very important after Flint, Michigan, we are all responsible to know if our water is healthy or not. We move into supporting life and biodiversity of life on a healthy, clean river. It starts in the ocean with diatoms, these beautiful circular and other shaped things that are just brilliantly colored, and then goes to phytoplankton or the beginning of small micro, animals, micro plants, and then to uh, zooplankton or micro animals that they eat the phytoplankton, which eats the diatom, but they still, all of these take in carbon dioxide into the water and then give off oxygen with algae and other things. And then the small fish are eaten by the medium size, the medium size by the big size. Outside, there are um, flora and fauna that take the nutrients. There are vertebrates and invertebrates that live on and along and below the water. And then birds and other things and insects. Oh, and of course, people. So we move towards the uh, last part of water and this is equivalency. How much water is needed to grow an apple? 10 gallons. How much water is needed for a cup of apple juice? 60 gallons. Which of those would be the more sustainable choice? It's something new that clicks and you think, oh, okay, I can make that change. And then they begin to ask questions like, how much does it take to make this pen or my cell phone or your black dress, Vicki? And we begin to look further. Tea drinkers, eight gallons. Cup of coffee, that's me, 35 gallons. Two liter bottle of soda, 132 gallons for that liter. Pair of jeans, 500 gallons. Hamburgers, like we talked before, 630 gallons. And then cotton t-shirts, which Walgreens sells to us for $3 uh, for $10, three for 10. In the summer, 700 gallons. What's not right with this system? So we come up with an equivalency um, worksheet so that it can give you an idea of why a low flush toilet is important because humans usually use the restroom eight times a day. And if you have toilets built before like 1960s, they might use seven or eight gallons instead of one and a half. Big difference, it's time to become progressive. And so how much water do you use? We'll take the simple things done inside of the house and including drinking and you keep a chart and you compare it after a week. And then you ask yourself, how can I conserve water? And almost done, we look at the world water usage. What do you think? Who is 2%, 6%, 22, and 70? We are 2% humans and what we drink and the flowers and the um, animals that live. And 6% we use in our homes now with our washing machines and our cleaning of food and our cleaning of our clothes. Industry is next. The big user 
is industrialized agriculture. And think of it like this. Remember when we started bringing cars into a city and we said, oh, we need to park these. So we had a parking lot, single level parking lot, just took away all the grasses and the wetlands and cut down the forest and drained the wetlands and paved it. Get rid of nature. We have time room for cars. Now we have car parks, you know, garages, they are levels. This is agriculture that takes a single level of land. It throws air up or water up to irrigate it when 30% goes immediately on an 80% day back into the air and not into the land. Turns out that the Roman way of gravity to system and land to plants roots was much better. So you take your water footprint and you find out you're going to need to make some changes. So here's what they learned. Or one country. I learned that like Michigan was once a territory where people lived. And those people found an abundance of life in the clear water and in the dunes and in the wetlands and the savannas and prairies. So I'm going to leave you with some thoughts to think about as teachers and as students. The global demand for water, if you remember the little movie, is expected to rise by 30%. Here's a map showing countries sized by water usage, and by and large, they're the wealthier countries. And as climate change, that one degree goes higher, there's going to be water stress around the world, not only in the in the poorer countries that they're already doing the best they can with as little as they can, they're very frugal, but also the companies that are or countries that are wealthy. Water is the new oil. So we're gonna end with a couple of wonderful inventions that are helping to solve that problem. The life straw, if you ever travel abroad, great to take one of these. You can drink water without catching any um, diseases. See the person down in the bottom middle there. And then the second one, there's women who carry those clay pots, which I can't imagine, plus carrying a clay pot, plus five gallons of water. Think about it. Just carry two gallons around for five miles. That's a workout. These are roller, hippo rollers, and they can go together and come back with enough water for the week for their entire family. Or we can meet Zaria Foreman who she and her mother used to paint the oceans. And after her mother passed, Zaria kept painting. And she was picked up by NASA to fly around the world and paint the glaciers. Look at these beautiful paintings. This is where the glacier is going to fall in very soon. And this is where it's already falling and breaking apart. So people would begin to build empathy and understanding of that the fact that the melting of glaciers will in fact where they live and who they are. We encourage you to create a waters exhibition where students can make projects and posters and videos and even raffle goldfish off of these little uh, vertical apartments so that people can actually take something to home to take care of. You can also consider creating a floating classroom on a lake or a river where you can bring in experts who this is their work and their careers, the flora and fauna study, or the data of all the water or the water organizations. So there you go. Please reach out with questions and I will be happy to respond to your emails. We're gonna take a break and come back to the next nexus. Thank you.